really need to be vigilant about who you're working with, talk to other people that have done business with them. And, you know, again, you're going to find people in the, in the industry that have, that have done business with those guys, if they're been around for a while. As an operator, I know other investors are romanticizing multifamily investing, and I'm looking to learn from other investors' mistakes. I know you are too, and you found the right place. Welcome to Myers Methods Presents Multifamily Missteps. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Multifamily Missteps. I'm your host, Jerome, and we are going to the Midwest today to hang out with my friend Rodney Thompson. Rodney, how are things out there? Where are you, Minneapolis? Where are you? I'm uh, kind of about, I'd say, two hours southeast of Minneapolis, right in the in the lower corner of, of Minnesota, about 30 minutes from Iowa and 30 minutes to Wisconsin. 30 minutes to Iowa, 30 minutes to Wisconsin. Some people would say that is absolutely the middle of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, close so, enough to where I can give my friends who are Packer fans a lot of grief. Ah, there we have it. You yes. gotta know your allegiance, ladies Especially and gentlemen. my son-in-law. <laughs> oh, boy. So, you know, I, Rodney, I haven't seen or heard you on a ton of podcasts, so... The audience may not know who you are. Do me a favor and give them a little bit about your background, what you've been up to and how you got into this multifamily space. Well, I've been in IT for about 30 years up until June of this year when I retired from uh, the university that's north of here. And retirement, hey. baby, we're out. Freedom. <laughs> I did. I did. And uh, it's, uh, you know, the, the whole retire from W2 is, is a goal that I think a lot of people have. And uh, I would say you listen to everybody and, and it's interesting because you hear all these different stories about, well, I, I, I just made the jump, right? And I I'd used credit card debt and, and, and here I am today and I'm worth X million dollars. Or I planned it all out and I had all this money in the bank. And I wish I could say that I followed one of those rules. And, but <laughs> I was, my, my goal was to follow the second one, you know, to be financially ready for it. And our, our uh, university was, had a budget crunch, needed to make some changes, was offering some early retirement. And I had about, about 14 months to get to a point where I could replace my income. Talked it over with my wife. We thought it was a good move. And so we signed the forms and it was a one-way street. Couldn't, uh, couldn't do anything different. And uh, then COVID hit and turned everything upside down. And, you know, it's, I, I was telling um, John Kasman the other day, I said, you know, everybody talks about how 2020 was a train wreck. And I think that when you're presented with a challenge like that, you can make a choice about what you can do. You either can, you know, sit in front of Netflix all day and, and bemoan where the economy is going and how you don't have a job. Or if you have a job, maybe you haven't gotten a raise for a year, whatever the case may be, or you can make something happen. And I didn't want to sit around and wait for something to happen. And so I looked at the whole situation. I said, what can I change? What do I have control over? In, in my life and in my surroundings that I can work on. And I determined that since deals weren't flowing because the sellers had pulled things off the market and buyers were wary and, and lending was constrained, I could work on my brand. So that's what I spent my time doing is working on my brand and getting on LinkedIn and getting connected with people like you and the host of other people out there on LinkedIn that are looking to network and and work together to make things happen and so that's pretty much what i spent 2020 for the most part doing now the uh, get to the end of you know get towards the end of 2020 and things are starting to you know pick up back again and so i started analyzing some deals and got a uh, a deal under contract in des moines and we closed in the middle of 21 
And, and uh, so things are starting to cook. We, we just closed on another deal in Lincoln and we got more on in the pipeline. So I can't complain about that. Now, I didn't really answer your question because you were asking about background. Being in IT, I knew I didn't want to be in that forever. And so I started looking around and, and I have a friend of mine that was big into the whole fire movement, you know, financially independent, retire early type of deal. He turned me on to some podcasts and one of those were bigger pockets. And so we had owned some single family along the way because we knew that real estate was really the way to go. But I ran into somebody that was a guest on that show talking about multifamily. And I started really looking at multifamily and I said, I was just kind of blown away with the whole forced appreciation and, and how commercial properties valued. And so that really got me excited. And then I started looking into multifamily and got me a mentor and just been full steam ahead ever since. Full steam ahead. Absolutely. So do you feel like going through the mentorship program was beneficial for you? I do. You know, getting into commercial multifamily, when you're buying assets that are in the multi-million dollar range, it's a, there's a very high barrier to entry. And uh, for the person that, that's looking to, you know, for a mentor, uh, you can do a couple of different things. You can, you can partner with somebody and, and, I, and I'll use this term loosely, but, you know, get a, a free education, if you will, uh, or, you can, or you can pay to join one of the programs and accelerate your, your uh, movement forward. And that's what I wanted to do because I wanted to make a change as fast as possible. And uh, as far as, you know, what group to join, that's really the $64,000 question, right? I, I think that you have to really look at where you want to go. What's your concentration? You know, everybody choose, you know, or, or everybody chooses to get into deal analyzing first because it's the easy thing to get into if you want to, if you want to call it that. Uh, and I think that's a good place to start because whether you're raising capital or whether you're doing asset management or whether you're doing deal acquisitions, broker relations, you need to understand the deal. And the best way to understand the deal is through the underwriting. And if you don't understand the underwriting, then you can't properly talk to your investors. So that that's really an integral part of, of the whole process. Now, if you want to be primarily into capital raising, you should really look around for a group that specializes in that. And, and then, uh, because they're gonna understand how to analyze the deals too. But uh, not all groups specialize in certain areas. Some are generalists, some are in acquisition, some are in capital raising. So I think you really gotta search and find and talk to people, find people that are in the group, find people that are not in the group, find out why they're in the group, why they left the group and, and really get a good, grip because you're going to drop some coin joining these groups. But you have to look at it like, hey, I'm, I'm buying an MBA and, and I'm going to get there faster than if I do OJT. On the job training is the school of hard knocks and the slowest and most ineffective way to make <laughs> your progress towards your dreams and goals, man. I love it. So with all that training and education, I assume that every project has went exactly as planned as you oh, went on this absolutely. journey, right? I tell you what, Jerome, I got in this business. It's been super easy. I'm making millions of dollars. You know, I just sit back and wait for, wait for the money to show up. Well, why did you ever go work in <laughs> IT if that was the case? <laughs> Duh. You know, uh, but it's, uh, it's funny to listen to Rod Cleef talk about these, uh, what does he call them, learning seminars when the when he makes mistakes. And I think that anybody who uh, has a, a deal go perfectly smooth, you got to pinch yourself or look and see what might be wrong with the whole situation because they don't. No, they, you know, they they all have their problems. Some are big and some are small, and some can cost you a lot of money, and some are just some correction, you know, in in course. And so. Um, yeah, it's it's not a it's not a, a bumpy free ride. For sure. So 
I, I don't know which deal you want to go through, but I feel like you got some lessons that you've learned on your journey that you can help save our listeners from. I did. I do. Um, I, I did a deal and uh, I there this is there's a couple of le- lessons in this deal. One is uh, I relied on a mortgage broker to have my best interest in mind. And I'm not saying that that they don't or that, that any of them out there are in it for themselves, because I think every, each person within real estate um, operates differently. The, the, the thing about real estate, and I, I know you know this, it's kind of a small sandbox, right? Very there's, small. Even though there's thousands of uh, syndicators and brokers, there are uh, main players and everybody gets to know everybody. And all of the networking events, somebody knows somebody along the way. But uh, when you sign a contract, everybody pretty much knows that you should read all the paperwork that goes along with it. But I think that when, at least, you know, this is my perspective. So this may not be the thing for everybody, but when I was working with other professionals, I would have, my assumption was, and we all know what happens when we assume uh, that they that they were operating not only for their benefit, but you always hear about how all these players are partners. That that it, you know it takes a team to make this happen, and it does. But I didn't read through the loan docs like I should have, and there were some clauses in there that I wouldn't have signed had I known that they were in there. And I don't know if the loan broker thought that those were passable, but uh, this, this came back to, you know, bite me in the butt. And where it did was when uh, this was a bridge loan. So it was a little different, but we had a, a CapEx reserve and we had a, a, an interest reserve. And traditionally, the interest reserve was there if you had shortfalls on your mortgage payment, that it would make up the difference. And this particular lender took that shortfall. And first of all, they moved part of it to the CapEx dollars because they didn't think we had enough CapEx. And, and uh, when they did that, I didn't see that they had done that. And so what happened was our reserve account was short to execute our business plan. And then they, then the other thing they took the the reserves and rather than allowing us to use them in, uh, you know, our, our nine month window, our renovation window, because we were being very aggressive on this project. We wanted to vacate entire buildings renovate the entire building and then do a lease up. And we did that over the whole property, nine, nine buildings. Well, when you do that and you start in renovations and then you start clearing out the second building, your occupant, your occupancy runs down around in the fifties. And when you're there, cash flow is constrained and you're not going to be able to make your debt service. And so you rely on, the money that you raised to put in your interest reserve to make those debt service payments. Well, the the lender took our debt service payments. Not only did they cut it in almost a third, but then they spread those payments evenly over 12 months. And so it was, it was spread across 12 months instead of being more front end loaded, like we needed it. And so it's, it's been a challenge and we go back and we're trying to renegotiate with the lender, but that that's, uh, you know, it, it's I I look at it and I say, well, that's on me. If I would have read, you know, the loan docs to understand what they were doing and the distribution, I wouldn't be in that same pickle. So that's a lesson learned. And you know, it could be it can be daunting because when you start closing on these things, I mean, we're talking about not five or six page contract like you like when you're buying a car. We're we're talking about fifty to one hundred and fifty pages loan do, you know documents that you have to go through, and it can be a bit daunting. So, but I still and I encourage people to read through those docs, and uh, and then 
when we got when we we did our our capex budget uh we sat down with a contractor and went through everything that we wanted to do and, and got numbers presented that to the lender and that's where the lender thought that we were short well the come to find out the contractor um kind of was flying money you know flying numbers off of his hip and so then we started doing capex and all of a sudden hey we're we don't have money on the you know it it's not that we didn't have enough money because we have all this capex all this you know uh, capex reserve that was designated for this but what happens is is they come back with change orders and they say oh by the way uh you know we didn't account for this so we we need an extra fifteen thousand dollars we need an extra you know thirty thousand dollars or an extra five thousand dollars here and there well you have a contingency built in but if you're if you have ten and fifteen thousand dollars flying out of that contingency fund at a time, it's going to go in a hurry. So, my my recommendation there is is get get more uh, bids on what you're going to do to check against other contractors so that you know what your capex budget should be. Because if you're short, you can't execute your business plan. And the lender expects you to because you have pro forma expectations. And if you don't meet those expectations, then you're going to be in breach of contract. And you're not going to be able to make your, your, your uh, payments and you're not going to be able to do lease ups and it just snowballs. A lot of people want to be profitable multifamily operators, but lack the knowledge, deal flow, experience and capital to be successful. They often try to overcome these challenges out of order, slowing or eliminating their ability to get the next deal done. We have developed a framework that allows them to gain the knowledge they need to find profitable deals. When they use our system, they create time and location freedom, as well as the generational wealth they desire for their family. The Multifamily Kickstart program has proven to be the fastest way to establish credibility and build a profitable apartment portfolio. Hop over to drawmyers.co to find out more. Whoa. <laughs> so two questions before I even go anywhere. One, how big was the property? And two, was this bridge debt? It was bridge debt. And the property is 360 units. And it, it's actually a two property portfolio. One, we were doing extensive rehab on 270 units. The other 90 units uh, was not as extensive, but it was still uh, pretty, uh, I'd say a medium lift, whereas the, the 270 was a heavy lift. And it, even though the property wasn't uh, vacant when we bought it, uh, the previous owners had uh, a lot of deferred maintenance and when they decided to sell it, they filled it up with people that wouldn't meet our expectations for tenants. And that presented a lot of problems. And we've had, uh, we've had shootings. <laughs> we've had, uh, we've had people that have got arrested for drugs. We've had homeless people challenges that have been getting into buildings and camping out. Um, Let's see. And it's this is not in a bad part of town, by the way. Now, it sounds like it is. But here's here's the here's what you have to look at when you're you know, you, you look at the neighborhood, you look at the at the, what's going on as far as uh, how is the neighborhood growing and industry and all this stuff that you do during your underwriting. But what you don't account for is your. And, and we did, we walked every single unit, we had DD. And of course, this is, you know, this is class C apartments. And so you're going to see a lot of things. I won't go into it, but you, you're going to see a lot of things. Because there may be tenants in there that don't meet your expectations. Well, there was a lot of that. And we found out that there was a lot more than we anticipated. And where, where we run into problems is, is that all of those tenants attract other things. So it's kind of like if you have if you don't have mice, just leave something laying out 
it, the word will get out and the mice will come to, you know, dine on whatever you left out there. So you may not have mice at the moment, but, you know, if you, if you attract that, that's what you're going to get. And so I, I see from the time that we took over until now that it's so different. Uh, you know, we painted the exterior. The, there was so much lighting that wasn't working and we fixed all the lighting. And so the place is just lit up like a cruise ship now. And, you know, that, that doesn't, you know, people don't like to hang out in the light if they're up to nefarious things. And there was, Oh, this, it was crazy. Jerome, there was 176 cars in the parking lot that were either sitting on flat tires or didn't have a license plate or were on temporary tags. 176 cars. <laughs> Is that crazy? So I can't we, had a, that, huh? we had a lot of cleanup. We had a lot of cleanup and now the place is, is uh, in, in fact, we, you know, we're looking at other properties in the area and, and I had another uh, area regional manager say to me, say, Hey, you guys have that property over on the other side of town, don't you? Yep. And uh, says, man, I can't believe the difference that since you guys took over and that's what we like to hear. I think everybody who's buying C's and repositions them, that's what we're going for is to actually make the world a better place. And so kudos to you guys for diving in on what feels like it might have been a grenade, man. Holy <laughs> smokes. So, oh boy. you know, how did, what, what, ha how did you resolve basically your money being taken out of your account and pushed into places you didn't expect it? Like, did you pause renovations and wait for cash flow to catch up? Did you guys do a capital call? Like, how'd you overcome that? we had to do a capital call, um, with the GPs and, uh, you know, so it's the, it, it's not, uh, it's not a capital call as in, we decided that we didn't want to, we didn't want to muddy the returns. And so we chose to do short-term loans from, from the GPs that we could resolve, you know, fairly quickly. And then that kept our returns high for our investors. And, so that has been the, the temporary stop gap there. Uh, we're working with the lender to see if we can get that modified. Um, we're kind of, I won't say that we don't have any hope that it won't get, but um, I think that my, you know, my anticipation is when you work with a lender that they should be a partner and I They're hear your biggest people, partner in the deal. <laughs> yeah, I, I because hey, if you succeed, they succeed. But but I run across people. They say no, no, no. Lenders not you know not your partner because you know they they want one thing and for you to make your mortgage payment and they don't care about the rest. And, they don't. and I I hope that's not true. <laughs> I, you know it may be true, but I mean I I would hope that's not true. But um, yeah, it's I tell you what, it's a learning experience. I mean, I. I don't think that we're in a situation where it's cost money to the point where our reputation is damaged because that's the first thing we want to stop for sure. Because we, um, when, when you put together a deal and you present it to investors, of course you can't promise that everything's going to be rosy or that the returns are going to be this because you don't know, you know, it, it's a risk. It's a, an assumed risk and we mitigate that risk as much as we can. And when we do well and over deliver and under promise, it makes investors happy because they want to invest with you again. And so that's, that's really where we have to keep our focus on what are we doing to make it good for our investors? Uh, because if, if we have hard lessons to learn and it ends up costing us money, but our investors still make money, which, you know, obviously that's not our plan it, to, to not make money for us. Obviously we're in this for them, you know, to, you know, it's a business just like anything else, but, but in the end of in, at the end of the day, if for some reason we had to take shorts and make our investors whole, that's what we want to do. 
That's what most good GPs do, my friend. So, man, have you changed the process so this never happens again? I make sure and read all the documentation. <laughs> And, 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 you know, again, with the, uh, with the whole contractor thing, you really need to be vigilant about who you're working with, talk to other people that have done business with them. And, you know, again, you're going to find people in the, in the industry that have, that have done business with those guys, if they're been around for a while, because like, you know, like we said earlier, it's a small sandbox. A lot of people know other people. And so get recommendations, get second opinions, um, and, and make sure you read the documentation because boy, it, it's so easy to rely on somebody else or trust somebody else. And, and uh, you're signing your name to that. They're not signing their name. Man, man, man. <laughs> You know, people just kind of like, oh yeah, I'll just sign and we got a deal done and all the excitement. And then you actually have to live with the terms that you agreed to. And you realize, wait, I might've painted myself in a corner and that is not exciting at all. No, it's not. So Rodney, you know, the last question I ask on these episodes is what's some words of wisdom you have for the listeners? If, uh, you're talking about people that are wanting to get into multifamily or people that are in multifamily or kind of a host both. of everything. Both. Yeah. Both. Um, well, I think that most people that are in multifamily understand uh, there are sayings that we say over and over again, your network is your net worth. And, and everybody talks about, all right, well, people would assume that that's cliche, but it's so important. Um uh, working on your personal brand and connecting with other people that are in your space, I think is really important. And, and then, you know, guard, guard your reputation because when you're talking to future investors, they're going to want to know past performance. And if you've delivered on what you said, uh, it speaks volumes. Keep your word. That's all you have. Absolutely. In this Exactly. Wow. Well, Ronnie, and invest in yourself. You. Invest in yourself. I mean, you know, you and I have been on podcasts before where we've talked about investing in yourself, and it's it is so important. For sure, for sure, Rodney. Thank you so much for joining us on Multifamily Missteps. I I'm still picking up my jaw <laughs> for what <laughs> happened because I mean, lenders write those documents so that it's easy for them to protect themselves and. You know, if you don't really understand what you're agreeing to, you can get yourself in a real pickle. And absolutely. It, yeah, they they have their number one concern is them. As it should be. It's their money, as they would tell me. <laughs> yeah. So right. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for jumping on, man. This was awesome. Well, thanks for the invite, Jerome. I really appreciate it. It's uh it's an honor to be on your show. And uh, you know, because you and I have done other podcasts, you've been on my podcast. And so I, I think it's awesome to, to be on your podcast. Awesome. Awesome. And to the listeners, the pack's with you. We'll talk soon. You made it to this juncture. So you really love what we shared on this episode of Myers Methods Presents Multifamily Missteps. Do us a favor. Give us a five-star rating. Give us a review and share this with somebody who's interested in multifamily investing. Until the next time, the pack is with you. Ooh.